you wake up Ew. and a sharp smell of rotten eggs Ew. hits your nostrils. You look around wildly and realize the smell isn't coming from your mom's cooking downstairs. It's super hot and there are giant red clouds churning in the sky. Yikes! You're on Venus! The planet is named after the ancient Roman deity of beauty and love. But sadly, its smell doesn't correspond with its name. The atmosphere of Venus is made up mainly of carbon dioxide, but thick clouds of sulfuric acid completely hide its surface from prying eyes. Sulfur has a really bad stench, which causes the surface of Venus to smell like rotten eggs. Gross! The atmosphere on the planet is also really hot and thick. The carbon dioxide traps a small amount of energy from the sun that reaches the planet's surface. This greenhouse effect has made Venus one of the hottest places in the solar system. So the good news is, you wouldn't be able to smell the planet's stench as humans can't survive on its surface. Well, that's a relief. Almost all other planets in our solar system only have a super small selection of different scents on their surface, unlike Earth. But what about our moon? The scent of the moon is similar to something called smokeless powder, which is a propellant used in firearms. Basically, the dust on the satellite smells exactly the same as when a shot is fired. Apollo 17's pilot Eugene Cernan says he could smell it straight after removing his suit from the spacecraft. But nobody's exactly sure why it smells like this, as there's zero similarity between the two substances. Smokeless powder is made up of a mixture of two things with very complicated names, nitroglycerin and nitrocellulose. Black powder, its older counterpart, is made of charcoal, saltpeter, and sulfur, which makes it smell in a very specific way, but not like rotten eggs, despite the sulfur content. Moon dust is made up of a bunch of things that primarily come from broken meteorites. This includes iron, magnesium, and calcium, but it doesn't contain either of the things in smokeless powder or black powder either for that matter. And what's weirder is that moon dust samples brought back to Earth have been odorless. Experts say the smell could have been the dust reacting with oxygen or water inside the lander. The smell could also be due to the temporary release of charged particles from the sun that had become trapped in the dust. Mercury is the planet closest to the sun, but it doesn't really have a strong smell. This is because the atmosphere is so thin and scattered. Mars. Like Venus, it's another world that doesn't have the best scent ever. It's a good thing we can't breathe its air. The red planet smells like rotten eggs, again caused by sulfur. If human colonies did move to Mars, it looks like we'd have to burn a lot of scented candles to cover the smell. But the good news is that the sulfur quantities are pretty small, so the smell wouldn't be too overwhelming. Jupiter also has a whiff of eggs, but also smells a bit like it's been mixed with cleaning products. This is because its atmosphere is a mixture of hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. But what you smell basically depends on where you are in the planet's atmosphere. Some regions have higher concentrations of ammonia. This substance is used in a bunch of cleaning products here on Earth. So areas high in ammonia could have that strong burning stench of cleaning fluid. A lot of people also Ew. say that ammonia smells like a pair of dirty socks that haven't been washed in forever. So it's for sure best to avoid these parts of the planet. Other areas have a lot of hydrogen sulfide, and because it contains sulfur, these parts would also smell like rotten eggs. The third and final scent you'd find on Jupiter is bitter almonds, or marzipan, just like the kind your grandma puts on cakes around the holidays. This is in areas where a substance called hydrogen cyanide is most common. Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system. It's so big that it's 2.5 times larger than all of the other planets in the solar system combined. It's also the fastest spinning planet in our solar system. Next up, the ringed planet, Saturn. Its atmosphere is made up of about 96% hydrogen and 4% helium. Yes, that's the gas that makes your voice go all squeaky. Both hydrogen and helium are odorless, so Saturn probably doesn't have a strong smell. It does, however, contain traces of our good friend ammonia. That's the smelly sock gas. 
Saturn's atmosphere also has a bit of phosphine, which can sometimes smell like garlic or decaying fish. So there might be a slight bad stench in the air. The thickness of Saturn's atmosphere is only 37 miles. For comparison, our atmosphere here on Earth is almost 300 miles thick. Saturn also has some of the strongest winds in our solar system. They can reach a whopping 1,118 miles per hour. One of Saturn's moons is called Titan, and it has a super odd scent. Its atmosphere is made up of something called benzene, which has really weird effects if inhaled by us humans. It can make us feel dizzy and make our ears ring. It doesn't actually smell that bad, though. Its scent is kind of like almonds. Now it's time to take a dive into Uranus. This gas giant has gotten itself a reputation as the smelliest planet in the entire solar system. There's a lot of stinky stuff floating around on the planet, and its upper atmosphere is made up mostly of hydrogen sulfide. Yep, that's the molecule that makes rotten eggs smell so nasty. But the temperatures are so severe on Uranus that you'd pass away even before you've had a chance to smell anything. Uranus's atmosphere is a staggering negative 392 degrees Fahrenheit. That's so cold that it would almost instantly freeze anyone. The final planet in our solar system is Neptune, and it's just as cold as Uranus at negative 373 degrees Fahrenheit. Neptune also smells pretty bad. Some scientists say it smells like seaweed that's washed up on the shore. Others say again that it smells like rotten eggs because it contains a bunch of hydrogen sulfide molecules. But like on Uranus, you're not going to have time to take in the nasty smell. As the most distant planet from our sun, it's dark, freezing cold, and has supersonic winds. No one would be able to survive when faced with one of the icy hurricanes which are constantly raging on the planet. Neptune is the only planet in our solar system that's not visible to the unaided eye. Well, we've covered the planets, but what does space itself smell like? Space is mostly a vacuum, which means it doesn't actually contain any molecules, so there's basically nothing to smell. But some astronauts have actually said space smells a bit like fried meat or hot metal. This smell is most commonly reported in the first instance after the astronauts re-enter their spacecraft. They shut the airlock, repressurize, and then remove their helmets. But there are a bunch of theories suggesting that the meat smell isn't actually space. It's either from the equipment operating the airlock or from interactions between space particles and the spacesuits. Astronaut Tony Antonelli said that space definitely has a smell that's different than anything else. Talking about his fellow spacewalkers coming into the ship, another astronaut, Don Pettit, said he noticed that this smell was on their suit, helmet, gloves, and tools. One thing we definitely know that has a smell, though, is comets. If you could inhale a big whiff of a comet, it's likely going to make you feel lightheaded and maybe even sick. The odor from comets is like a mix of rotten eggs, old smelly socks, almonds, and it'll also have a hint of biology dissection lab. On the bright side, though, the presence of hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide in the scent would block your sense of smell after the first sniff. So at least the stench wouldn't linger. But the bad news? Nearly all the ingredients that make up a comet's smell are toxic. So you're probably going to want to avoid coming into contact. Back when Apollo missions were launched, astronauts returning from the moon claimed that moon dust, the gray sand-like dust covering much of the satellite surface, smelled and tasted, yes, they actually tasted it, like gunpowder. But the stuff moon dust is made of is nothing like gunpowder. About half of its composition is silicon dioxide glass from impacts with meteorites. They hit the surface of the moon at incredible speeds. Whoa! The high temperature makes the topsoil fuse into glass, and the impact shatters it right afterwards, creating the gray and clingy dust. The rest of moon dust ingredients are minerals such as iron, calcium, and magnesium, while old-fashioned gunpowder consists mainly of saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur. In other words, moon dust shouldn't smell like gunpowder, but it does. Besides, when astronauts brought samples of it back to Earth, there was no smell left at all. 
One explanation could be that the moon is similar, in a way, to Earth's sand deserts like the Sahara. It's extremely dry and arid. When you sniff the air in a desert, you don't smell anything. But if you get caught in the rain there, the moisture will raise all kinds of odors from the ground that were previously trapped in the dry sand. With moon dust, it might be similar. While on the surface of the moon, it doesn't smell at all. Not that the astronauts could sniff at it wearing their spacesuits, though. But when brought back inside the landing module, the dust came into contact with moisture in the air and started emitting its strange odor. Another reason for this could be a reaction of moon dust to the solar wind. Ionized particles from the sun hit the bare surface of the moon and stay there. There's no thick atmosphere to protect it from those ions, so they travel freely right to the ground. They're very lightweight, so they can fly off and sort of evaporate from the slightest of nudges. And when astronauts took the moon dust samples to the landing module, those particles could have started moving around and giving off the specific smell. This might also explain why the samples didn't keep their odor when brought back to Earth. Since the particles are so light, they might have flown off the samples already in the landing module. And when they were placed in airtight containers, there were little or no ions left on them. Another explanation is that those airtight containers weren't so airtight after all. Moon dust is basically very small crystals with extremely sharp edges. They unexpectedly made tiny cuts in the seals, letting in air and moisture, and so the ionized particles leaked out of the containers. Scientists believe they should study moon dust on the surface of the moon itself to find out everything about its properties. Now, there are hundreds of thousands of craters on the surface of the moon made by falling asteroids, but one of them drew a lot of attention. It turned out to not be just an impact crater, but a tube, looking most like an entrance to a cave system. Scientists found a specific echo pattern that suggested there was a hollow area beneath. They discovered more echo patterns at a couple of places near the hole, so there could be more lunar tubes there. But in this big tube, you could place an entire football field. Researchers believe there could be an entire geological wonderland under the surface. It could be a good shelter for astronauts landing on the moon or even be a harbor for a lunar colony. No one ever managed to stay on the moon for more than three days because of the conditions on the satellite. Wide range of temperatures, low atmosphere, no magnetic field would protect life on the surface from things like radiation or solar wind. Astronauts wear spacesuits. They can't protect them over long periods of time, but a lava tube could. When a lava flow cools, it gets a hard crust, which later thickens and creates a roof over that same lava. It continues to flow, but when it stops, the channel can drain, and that's how an empty tube appears. Our planet also has lava tubes, but they're not as big as the one found on the moon. Back in 1178, I wasn't around then, at least five people in England claimed they had seen the moon split into two from its upper tip. It was in the shape of a crescent at the time of the event. When the crack widened, fire started blazing from it, which the single monk who chronicled it described it as a flaming torch sprang up, spewing out fire, hot coals, and sparks. Then the moon started shifting around and pulsating, but soon stopped and turned a slightly darker shade. The event didn't receive much attention from scientists, though, until the second half of the 20th century. Researchers studied the chronicle and figured out there was a huge, 14-mile-wide crater on the surface of the moon at about the spot described in the book. Only a very large asteroid could have left such a scar on the satellite's face. And when they investigated it more closely, they found out it was pretty recent by astronomical standards. In fact, it really could have appeared about 800 years ago. But in that case, millions of fragments from the asteroid and the moon would have hit the Earth as well. And then people would have seen an incredible meteor shower. It would have been very bright, and the memories of it would have definitely been in the archives. But that didn't happen. In addition, many scientists argue that the crater isn't as young as it might seem. The most popular and justified theory is that it's about 1 to 10 million years old. If it had appeared as recently as 800 years ago, parts of the surface of the moon in and around the crater would still have been warm from the impact. The most likely explanation of what really happened back in 1178 is that observers were extremely lucky to see an asteroid falling towards the Earth and burning in our planet's atmosphere. The spectacle would have been incredible, 
and seen from a proper angle, the burst of the asteroid could have really looked like it was the moon exploding. That would explain why there were so few witnesses of the phenomenon. The right spot to see the show, as they did, was only a couple of miles wide. As for real events on the moon, water and oxygen were unexpectedly discovered on it not long ago. Water might have been brought to the satellite by asteroids hitting its surface, many of them carrying H2O molecules, and those that are left on the moon in tiny amounts after the impact. There's precious little water there, though. By comparison, even the Sahara Desert has more of it than the entire moon. Oxygen is also present as separate molecules floating around, so you still can't breathe on the moon. Solar wind brought them there. Waves of energy from the sun travel at extremely high speeds through space, scrape oxygen from the upper parts of our atmosphere, and carry it further. Eventually, the wind with the oxygen molecules reaches the moon. And that's where something incredible happens. The moon starts rusting. There's plenty of iron in the lunar soil, and when it's exposed to oxygen and water, it naturally rusts. Some parts of the moon have actually already turned slightly reddish. They're regions where there's the highest concentration of molecules. If this process goes on long enough, in the distant future, the moon will look like Mars. It will turn orange-red. Yes, the signature color of Mars came exactly from the corrosion that began there thousands and thousands of years ago when there were rivers and seas with water and an atmosphere with oxygen. Another unusual phenomenon is the blue and red lights on the moon. They can be seen when it's crescent-shaped. The flashes come and go very quickly, almost like lightning. And in fact, that's what they basically are – electric bursts. Tidal forces are to blame for this. They cause mechanical stress buildup in the rocks. This can produce an electric field which creates the blue flashes that have surprised many amateur astronomers. But still, there's so far been no green cheese discovered there. Or moon pies, for that matter. Disappointing, I know. In space, no one can hear you scream. Or is that, in space, no one can hear ice cream? Well, either way, we know that no supernovas, crashing asteroids, and burning planets make a sound in space. Or do they? What if you actually can hear something out there? Well, let's see. Okie dokie, back to middle school. Ahem. Sound is a mechanical way of originating from vibration. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, the simplest example is guitar strings. Let's pluck one of them. It starts to vibrate. The atoms inside the metal string begin to push and beat the atoms of the air around them. So now, atoms are constantly pushing each other until they reach our ears. It's like a wave from a pebble thrown into a pond, and it happens very quickly, at a speed of about 761 miles per hour. Then our eardrums begin to vibrate at the same frequency, and the little bones inside our ears transmit this vibration to the brain. The brain then does its magic, recognizes the pattern, and turns it into sounds. Great! Now we know that we need some particles to create sound. And we can find these particles in gases, liquids, and solid substances. And what about space? Nope, it's almost a perfect vacuum. And you've probably already heard that there's no sound in space because it's a vacuum. But what does it actually mean? Well, a vacuum is a perfect void. It's an area completely devoid of matter. It means there's nothing there. Yeah. Despite all those celestial bodies in space, there's actually no air in between them. No atoms, no particles, nothing. Not a zippo. Well, almost. To be honest, the perfect vacuum doesn't really exist. We can't get rid of atoms for good. But space is very close to this notion. On average, there are 15 to 80 atoms per one cubic inch. This may sound like a big number, but keep in mind that these atoms are tiny. And the void distance between them is huge. For comparison, one cubic inch of air contains about 16,000 atoms. So, of course, with such a low density, these atoms can't push each other. Even if the vibration is very strong, like, I don't know, a supernova, they still won't be able to do that. So, movies have been lying to us. All these epic space scenes actually take place in an awkward silence. Who would have guessed? But don't get upset. What if I tell you there are, in fact, some ways to hear sound in space? First of all, there's still sound on other planets. 
if there's an atmosphere on a space body, or at least something like gas, water, or a solid surface, there will be sound. In our case, the atmosphere becomes completely silent at about 60 miles above the Earth's surface. That's where the sky stops being blue and a black starry veil begins. In any case, we'd have to land on another planet, or at least get close to its atmosphere to hear something. But whatever it is, it would sound very different. Let's take our favorite Venus as an example. The atmosphere there is very dense. Scientists jokingly call it a thick chemical soup. No thanks. So, if you somehow managed to stay alive and speak there, your voice would be very different. It would become much louder, and it would sound deeper. So, if you want a pleasant baritone, you know what to do. I wonder what would happen if Earth had a denser atmosphere. What would we hear then? Well, you can vaguely imagine that if you've ever been in the water. Water is very dense. Sound moves there much faster and better compared to the air, at a speed of almost a mile per second, depending on the water temperature. So if you sit in an empty room with no sound sources, you won't hear much, right? Now, dip your head in the water and check out how the same silence sounds here. It's not quiet at all. Even if you ignore the ever-present sounds of the water itself, you'll immediately notice how well you can hear your own body, how your blood pulsates in the veins, how your heart works, the slightest movement of your fingers. Kind of creepy, isn't it? This gives us an idea of what would happen to us on a planet with a denser atmosphere. And that's just crazy. We would hear everything. From scurrying animals to the movement of tectonic plates. Ah, come on, you'd probably say. It's obvious that there's sound on other planets. But didn't you say we can hear something in open space? Actually, yes. For example, in a cloud of dust. You can find space dust almost everywhere in space. It may be the remains of a star or something else. And in these places, everything is a bit denser than usual. This means there are probably dust clouds where particles are very close to each other, which means they can produce sounds. Of course, those will be very quiet and transmitted over a very short distance. But it's better than nothing, right? Plus, we already have one real space sound recorded. It came from the Perseus galaxy, which is located 250 million light-years away from us. NASA recorded it in 2003. Those of us music geeks will want to know that it's a B-flat, 57 octaves below middle C on the piano. You'd have to add another 660 keys to the left on the keyboard. But its frequency is so low that the human ear unfortunately can't hear it. But besides that, we can only hear something inside spaceships. These are small pockets of air, after all. In a spacesuit, you would hear sounds very well, too including your breathing or blood circulation in a spacesuit. But two astronauts flying side by side wouldn't hear each other, even if they got very close and shouted very loudly. It's quite funny. If you, being an astronaut, bumped into something, it would be very loud for you, but your friend wouldn't hear anything. That's why astronauts use radio devices. 2091, cast your call to a 79 handle. Now, purely theoretically, if you could somehow crawl out of your spacesuit and survive, you'd be able to hear the chatter and noises going on inside the spaceship. But how? So look, we have some air inside the spaceship, and it transmits sound. It reaches the metal casing and gets through it. And then, if you leaned against the ship, preferably touching it with your elbow or knee, the sound would be transmitted to the brain directly through your bones, ignoring the ears. Yes, our bones conduct sound. That's how, for example, deaf people listen to music. It's called bone conduction. It's used in some headphones and some other technologies. You can do a little experiment. Hold your fingers over your ears. Shut them properly so that you really don't hear much. Then try to touch a sound source. It can be anything vibrating. For example, a speaker playing music with some part of your body where the bone is close to the skin. Now, watch the miracle happen. You can hear the sound not through your ears, but directly in your brain. But please, don't repeat this experiment in open space. You know, ice cream? Haha. <laughs>
Now, you've probably heard about things like the sounds of space, where you can listen, for example, to the sounds made by the sun or different planets. How do we record these ones? Easily. There is another way to hear sound in space – electromagnetic waves. In other words, a radio. Radio is the same form of electromagnetic radiation as light. These waves can travel in a vacuum without any problems. Astronauts' transmitters work that way. An astronaut says something to their friend. The sound waves turn into radio waves, reach the other person, and are then converted back into sounds. And this is how we get so-called space sounds. Our planet is actually very loud in that regard. We're sending a huge amount of radio waves into the universe, all radio signals we've ever listened to. It's a pity that they travel only 110 light years away from us. But you know, I think it's good that we don't hear everything that happens in space. Imagine if sound could easily travel through the universe? We would hear everything, from solar flares to nearby supernovas. Horrifying, right? So maybe we're just lucky. Hey, remember, in space, you can hear ice cream. Chocolate! Vanilla!